Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh Adventist Church. And this particular series is an excellent one on the book of Acts. This is lesson number 10 in that series for September 8 of 2018. And it's entitled The Third Missionary Journey. Now, if you know a little bit about the uh, what the Bible tells about the books of Paul, about Paul and his experiences, you know something about the third missionary journey where he spent a lot of time in Ephesus. So that will be our main focus today. As usual, however, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as your children, we've gathered now to think about the implications of a small portion of Scripture, something that has some very important words for us, some things to make us think about, as we share today what we have seen and heard and learned, may those who are looking in receive a blessing as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the third missionary journey. You remember the first journey he went up to the center part of Asia Minor, what we would now call Turkey. The second journey he went through that area again and ended up over in Corinth where he spent a year and a half. And now, on his way home from the second journey, he stopped in Ephesus, left off Aquila and Priscilla, and promised that he would come back. Well, now he's going to go back to see what he can do. We do not know nearly as much detail about the people he traveled with on this particular journey. Did he take Silas with him? We don't know. Uh, we know that Dr. Luke was with him, but prob almost certainly Timothy was with him. Um, but well, we'll see. They traveled thousands of miles in one sentence, the first sentence there, you know, through Asia Minor, Central Park, and then ending up in Ephesus. Well, one of the big questions that scholars have struggled with for years in reading this material is, by the time Paul goes back to Jerusalem, there seem to have been quite a number of churches that have sprung up in Asia Minor. So what happened? Did Paul himself travel to all those places and start all those churches while he was mainly in Ephesus? Or did other people come from various places and learn about the gospel while they were in Ephesus and then carried home? Or did People like Epaphras, one of Paul's friends, who apparently lived in either Colossae or Hierapolis and uh, seemed to be kind of in a pastor's role there. Did, did he come to Ephesus? And so, questions which we won't know until we get into the better land. That first missionary, the first verse on the third missionary journey says simply, after spending some time there, this would be in Antioch, he left and went through the region of Galatia and for just strengthening all the believers. So that's an easy way to take care of 1,500 miles, right? Well, we know that he got to Ephesus and he ended up spending about three years in Ephesus, um, one of the major cities of Asia Minor. What do we know about um, Ephesus? Just in general? It was a publishing part of the area. That, well, it yeah. ended up being a publishing center for the Christian organization, Christian groups, yeah. And then John the Revelator, John the... the was, yes, he was the, the, the head elder. With his mother, uh, John, or Jesus' yeah. mother, I think. That, yeah. yeah. They believe that his mother, uh, Jesus, the mother of Jesus, Mary, uh, actually passed away there. If you go there, they will show you a small chapel where supposedly commemorates her, her burial place. Um, the Temple of, uh, of Diana or mm -hmm. of Artemis. Yeah, was that's a major, major feature of ancient uh, uh, Ephesus. It's interesting, if you have a chance to visit Ephesus today, there's one pillar left. And it probably was, it wasn't even a complete pillar. It's probably pieces from two or three pillars up there, and there's a bird's nest on top of it. That's what's left of the Temple of Artemis. But the Temple of Artemis was originally four times as big as the huge temple to, um, now I got something blank in, in, in Athens, um, Parthenon. the Parthenon, the Parthenon Athens. 
Well, anyway. Of course, in Ephesus, where there's the one pillar out there, they have a, a picture or a diagram showing what it really was like. Yeah. If you could imagine stop in the right place. And there's also a big library that they've rebuilt there. Yes. In, and in a lot of form. other. They're madly rebuilding lots of stuff. There was a, a grass-covered hillside that, uh, you know, they had nobody had paid any attention to for years and years as they were rebuilding it. And someone says, I wonder if there's something under that. Started big of this huge, big buildings and houses and, and a place where they think there, there used to be a Christian lady offered uh, places for visiting Christians to stay. Um, all kinds of stuff going on in there. And who knows what they'll find next. Well, uh, moving on. Following his usual pattern, Paul began work in Ephesus by doing what? Going to the synagogue. synagogue. Going to the Jewish synagogue. Remember the Jews had this rule that if there were at least 10 Jewish families in a city or a town, they were expected to establish a synagogue. So there were very likely, uh, there were several synagogues, although there may have been only one. Um, Ephesus was probably the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire at that time, after Rome, Alexandria, and Egypt, and um, Antioch. Antioch, yeah, in Syria. So what did he do after he was kicked out of the Jewish synagogue? He moved next door to the <laughs> lecture hall of Tyrannus and spoke there daily, it says, for the next two years. So that meant if he really, if, if that was really exactly true, then he must not have had time to do much traveling around. Um, this no doubt became, a, this lecture hall of Tyrannus no doubt kept, became a kind of headquarters for the church in, in Europe probably or Asia Minor. Um, we also know that this was Paul's last complete journey in, or I should say journey in complete freedom. We know that he had come from Corinth. He had stopped in Ephesus, left off Priscilla and Aquila, as we mentioned. But while Paul was gone, some other things happened. Do you remember what happened in Ephesus while Paul was gone back to his hometown? Apollos came. Apollos. Apollos. Who was Apollos? He was a scholar. A scholar? From Alexandria. Born in Alexandria, down in Egypt. Apparently, he, what else do we know about him? He was converted to, by John the Baptist. John the he was a follower of John the Baptist. Okay. Kerry, I think you have some words on that. Yes. On his arrival at Ephesus, Paul found 12 brethren who, like Apollos, had been disciples of John the Baptist, and like him had gained some knowledge of the mission of Christ. They had not the ability of Apollos, but with the same sincerity and faith they were seeking to spread abroad the knowledge they had received. That's from Acts of the Apostles, page 282, paragraph 1. How many disciples did John the Baptist have? I don't know that there was a number that we could... It's not numbered, but I mean, here's people that we, we wouldn't... We, if you had one of the Gospels, we would know nothing about these people. Nothing at all. Here's 13 people coming... We don't know where the 12 came from, whether they came from Asia Minor, whether they also came from Egypt. We just don't know. So you pick up little bits of information from these other stories that make you raise all kinds of questions, at least they do in my mind. Well, it, he wouldn't have, his ministry wouldn't have been, lim uh, he was limited in where he was, but of course people coming to the festivals from the di diaspora would have heard about him and may have come down and listen to him. So uh, there could have been people all over the place and then they went home. Yeah. Well, but these people must have been with him more than just uh, a short yeah. time. I mean, if he's, they were called disciples of John, I would have thought that meant they spent some time with him. Um, what kind of a hotel did they have out there in the desert to take care of these people? <laughs> well, so Paulus comes to Ephesus, he works there for a short time, and then he decided to do what? Remember? He thought he would move on to Corinth. Yeah. See what he could do with the church over there in Corinth. And uh, the church in Ephesus said, fine, 
we'll give you a letter, letter of recommendation. Now, you wonder about things like letters of recommendation. We, we do them all the time in our day. I have to re write letters of recommendation on a pretty regular basis, but how, what kind of letter of recommendation would you write for somebody who was in an illegal business? In fact, something that's against the law so much that if you were caught, you would die. Say, uh, hi friends, um, here's somebody who might want to talk to you. Because <laughs> obviously if you were caught with a letter of recommendation to the Christian church, that might be your end. Well, we don't know for sure. Fortunately, he made it and did a good work over at Corinth, as we know from other references. So next, the next big question is about the baptism. What was the difference between John's baptism and the baptism of Jesus? Or should it have been called the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Probably the biggest difference <clears throat> is that the baptism of John was designed to help people recognize their sins. Mm -hmm. Whereas the baptism of Jesus is the way to overcome sin. Okay. Do we know any more details about the baptism of, say, for example, the Holy Spirit? Well, back in Luke, and I'm looking for it right now. Uh, where it sort of it speaks of both. Um, oh, uh, that he says. Uh, well, it, it says somewhere else that he. Bapti uh, baptized unto repentance. Yeah. But uh, uh, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. Yeah. Um, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winning, winnowing fork is in his hand, so thoroughly clear, uh, his threshing, uh, too thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So there's okay. a whole process that goes to completion. It's how, how does his, how it, his starts, you know, it starts with repentance, but there's more to it than that is what it's. Well, let's look and see what we can learn about the baptism of Jesus and or the Holy Spirit. Fred, I think you have something here in Acts 19. Yes, uh, Acts 19, uh, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> this is from the Good News Translation, American Bible Society. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior of the province and arrived in Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit, they answered. <laughs> well then, what, did, what um, kind of baptism did you receive, Paul asked. The baptism of John, they answered. Paul said the baptism of John was for those who turned from their sins. And he told the people of Israel to believe in the one who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in strange tongues, probably you should say foreign tongues, yes. and also proclaimed God's message. There were about 12 men in all. Now this is very interesting. Paul placed his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came down on them and they could speak foreign languages. Now we know where that came from, right? Where, was, where did that happen before? At Pentecost. At Pentecost and where else? At Cornelius. At the home of Cornelius. And now it's happening here and Paul wasn't even one of the ones who had originally received. When did Paul receive this outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And it came down like fire, right? Well, he was baptized by Ananias mm -hmm. in uh, did, did he, did Damascus, he, I think. At that point, have this ability to speak in all kinds of languages and so forth. I mean, that's an amazing gift. There's a lot of things left out. 
that we wonder about. <laughs> wow, lots of stories to hear in the future, huh? Well, um, do you think they, that everyone who received the baptism of the Spirit, as these men did from Paul, were able to speak in any language where they traveled in the future? I mean, imagine having Paul put his hand on you, and all of a sudden you can speak any language anywhere in the world fluently. Or you could speak and be heard in and that be, language, sure. which is probably what happened. Yeah, but then when they spoke to you, you would understand them too, apparently, because they were, mm -hmm. it was specifically, and this is the important point, it was specifically for the purpose of spreading the gospel. No question about that. Well, Gordon, give us some more information about that. From Acts of the Apostles, page 39, paragraph 2. The Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves. Okay, now we need, I need to interrupt for a second. This, ta this is talking about the first disciples at Pentecost. Go ahead. Yes. So at that time. So mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the, gos the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign tongue. Wow. That would be quite a gift. Do you think, since we're looking forward to the coming of a, a latter rain, that that could happen again? Yes. Very likely. Greater things than these you will do. Mm -hmm. Although with Google Translate. It's amazing, right? <laughs> it is. I'm, I'm carrying on a correspondence with a Spanish-speaking pastor in Cuba. Just click oh. the button and there it comes. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. I think the guy sp sitting next to me has the gift of tongues. Yeah, well. That's about what? Just three. Oh, it's more than that. <laughs> Fluently. <laughs> yeah, mm. exactly. So, but these people got it the easy way. Well, um, then something I else think, happened. I, I think it's important to note, too, that at that time there were so many dialects, mm -hmm. uh, as there still is in the German language, for example. And uh, all throughout Africa, you were familiar yeah. with all these dialects. And sure you... You re realize that how important it was to be able to communicate yes. this message. Well, the thing that happened next is quite interesting. It always amuses me a little bit. This is Acts 19, 11 to 20. I'm just going to read that. God was performing unusual miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons he had used were taken to those who were ill, and their diseases were driven away, and the evil spirits would go, after, go out of them. Do you think people came along and said, Paul, could you please sneeze on this handkerchief so I can perform some miracles with it? I mean, how would that work out? Some Jews who traveled around and drove out evil spirits also tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus to do this. They said to the evil spirits, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Some seven brothers who were the sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva we're doing this, but the evil spirit said to them, I know Jesus, and I know about Paul, but you, who are you? <laughs> the man who had the evil spirit in him attacked them with such violence that he over overpowered them all. They ran away from his house, wounded with their clothes torn off. All the Jews and Gentiles who lived in Ephesus heard about this, and they were all filled with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was given greater honor. Many of the believers came publicly admitting and re revealing what they had done. Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burnt them in public. They added up the price of the books and the total came to 50,000 silver coins. In this powerful way, the, Lord, the word of the Lord kept spreading and growing stronger. Now, 50,000 silver coins, how much is that? 50,000 days of wages. 50,000 days of wages from a com for common labor if you calculate that out, in those days they worked six-day weeks. That would be 160 years of labor for common labor. And they burned it. Wow. Um, 
What do you suppose was the point of this handkerchiefs and aprons thing? I think it's important to remember we can't put God in a box and say, oh, God wouldn't do that or God isn't in that because you really need more than just what he's always done in the past as far as you know. Um, God does what is necessary, what he needs to do. So. Okay. Well, unfortunately, and I understand why this happens because there's a certain amount of limitation of space and so forth, our Bible study guide does not mention the problems that were going on in the church at Corinth during this time while Paul was primarily in Ephesus. Paul apparently took a ship and traveled straight across the Aegean to Corinth and was rebuffed and treated very meanly. After a short time, he went back to Ephesus wondering what he should do. Later, he wrote a very strong letter to them which he sent with Titus. That letter is probably the content that is now in 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. He waited with trepidation to see what the result would be. And that was the reason that he traveled to Macedonia and planned to go to Achaia and Corinth before going back to Jerusalem. Fortunately, he met Titus in Macedonia. Titus gave him the good news that the people of Corinth were ready and they wanted him to come back. It was there in Corinth, over the winter of AD 57 and 58, that Paul wrote the letters to Galatia and Rome. Well, having spent some time with his friends in Corinth, Paul was ready to return to Jerusalem with the very large offerings collected from the churches in Achaia, Macedonia, and Asia Minor. You read about that in Romans 15, 25 to 27, and 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 3. Now, they, uh, Paul just sent a letter of transfer through the bank. What happened? He had to take it. He had to take what? He had to take the Carry money. It with him. And how did he do that? It held. He had a lot of people carrying a lot of gold. I mean, just imagine, considering the circumstances and so forth like this, here they are, probably seven, maybe eight, nine, maybe ten men carrying loads of gold all the way from Corinth, basically, to Jerusalem. Wow. Yeah. Well, why was that necessary? Jerusalem Famine. Was Yes. In the days of Claudius, the emperor of Rome from AD 41 to 54, there was apparently a severe famine which had a terrible impact on the believers in Jerusalem. In the early days of the Christian church in Jerusalem, what had happened? Many of the people, including people like Barnabas, had sold what they had and given money to feed everybody. And so they weren't still, many of them, with a lot of, left, a lot of wealth left. Paul, hoping to improve his relationship with all believers in Judea, and especially with the Christian leaders in Jerusalem, saw this as an opportunity to build bridges. So what did he do? Well, money builds a lot of bridges. Money builds a lot of bridges? <laughs> yeah. Well, before we get that far with the story, why did he leave Ephesus? Do we need to read the story or? Yeah, riot. a riot. And if you, if you go to Ephesus even today, that theater where they gathered, where they wanted to grab Paul and take him and, 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 and I'm sure kill him, that theater is almost preserved almost completely intact. It's amazing, fab, huge big old theater. Open air amphitheater. Open, open air amphitheater, yeah. So, um, but he, they didn't get Paul. They caught some of his friends and treated them meanly and so forth. But it was started by Demetrius the silversmith. And what was, what was Demetrius's complaint? He wasn't Business. getting a trade like he used to. Yeah, he was <clears throat> losing money. They he, were all losing money. They were losing money because Paul was saying, these silver and gold idols don't do, any, don't do you any good. So this is economics and religion wrapped up together, huh? Well, what happened then with Paul? It's a good thing we don't have economics and religion mixed up together. It today. sure <laughs> is a good thing, yeah. 
<laughs> no. That's what Caiaphas was <laughs> complaining about. He says the whole oh. <laughs> word gets out about Jesus, the whole world's going to follow after him. Yeah, we're terrible. Saying thing. We're going to be out of a job. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, they grabbed Paul, and, and of course, the, the believers said, get out of town. Yeah. Well, what were they, th what's, fa what's famous about that riot is what they were yelling. What were they yelling? Greatest arm at, uh, Ar Artemis of, of Ephesus. Greatest Artemis of Ephesus. And, and the King James is greatest Diana. Diana is the Latin name for Artemis. What do you think Paul would have said if he would, had been given the opportunity to speak to that crowd? The chance for you to speculate a little bit. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ is the one. <laughs> I wonder. He said that he would never again do what he did in Athens, where he uh, yeah. had talked about the unknown God, the image to the unknown God. Yeah. So I don't know if he would have said this. This Diana, really, it's this image over here, God. I don't think he would have done that. Yeah, probably not. Um, the Temple of Diana, Diana was a place of massive sexual immorality, drunkenness, all kinds of stuff. And I, I just wonder how he would have compared that with the worship of the true God. Well, someone's already stolen my thunder and asked the question, are there any economic and financial considerations <laughs> or beliefs and practice of religion today? Think of the mega churches that we have around. Oh, yes. Wow. And part of the thing, I mean, let's, let's be honest, part of the thing that these pastors of mega churches have to, they have to live very affluent lives because what do we know? If you're good, the Lord will bless you. And if the Lord is blessing you, you drive a Mercedes or a Cadillac or a some other thing. And or a fleet of them. Or a fleet of them, yes, exactly. Uh, this may explain why touching <coughs> the handkerchief or other parts of um, <coughs> Paul might have helped. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't have all this status by any means, mm -hmm. something else had to reveal to these people that there was something special going on here. Yeah, very good. And God can do it without the riches. And the languages. That would convince, you that know. Would too. Uh, that Speaking in tongues. I mean, yeah. Well, in tongues. That's what you said. Yeah. I, I mean, I wonder how that speaking in tongues thing worked out in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Was this a, this is a, was this a repetition of what happened at Pentecost? Paul got up and lectured every day and everybody heard in their own language? We don't know. I mean, I all I'm sorry, but all kinds of questions race through my mind when I studied these stories. Well, Paul says in First Corinthians that I speak in tongues more than the, any of you. So yeah. apparently, it, it wasn't just something that he imparted yeah. to others. He he had full function. Yeah, I, I think of all the Seventh Day Adventist churches within five miles of here yes. with different languages spoken. Yes. Yes. And, you know, if, if one person could speak, could be heard in all those languages at one time, it would be a, it could be a real blessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to chuckle when you mentioned that. Um, I have a personal friend who unfortunately has passed on now, but um, he was sent by the Adventist Church to be a missionary in China, I mean, sorry, in Korea, South Korea. And he hadn't, hadn't been there very long when he decided he was going to just take this Korean thing by the horns and he was going to preach a sermon in Korean. So he, he developed a fairly short sermon, had someone translate it for him, had them coach him and so forth. And so he got up and he preached this sermon in Korean. And afterwards, one of the people said, man, a life. That guy was speaking English, and it sounded almost like Korean. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Heavy, heavy accent. <laughs> right? He had a heavy accent. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh. So, yeah, interesting. There's a story told about Ellen White 
And uh, in the northern part, I think it was Minnesota, one, one evening she gave a, a, a lecture in English. Uh, and most of the people there who spoke English, fine. But there was a lady from, from Sweden that was visiting, and she heard the whole sermon in Swedish. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's not beyond the possibility it could happen in our day. Well, look at Acts 20, verses 7 to 12. Paul's last visit to Troas. On Saturday evening, we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight. Now, you all know that in the King James it says, maybe I should just read it exactly so there won't be any questions about what it says here. And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together, came together to break bread, so why does my translation say Saturday evening? It's interpreting it uh, uh, from the Jewish reckoning of sundown. Yep. So yep. when the sun goes down on Sabbath. Saturday evening, according to Jewish reckoning, would be the first day of the week, first part of the first day of the week. And why, was he, why were they doing that? He kept on speaking until midnight since he was going to leave the next day. Many lamps were burning in the upstairs room where, he, they were meeting, where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window, and as Paul kept on talking, he just got sleepier and sleepier until he finally went sound asleep, fell from the third story to the ground. When they picked him up, he was dead. But Paul went down, threw himself on him, and hugged him. Don't worry, he said, he is still alive. Then he went back upstairs, broke bread, and ate. After talking with them for a long time, even until sunrise, Paul left. They took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So, we know that a lot of people have used this passage to suggest, well, this was the first Sunday, or at least one of the early Sunday gatherings, suggesting that uh, the early disciples now began worshiping on Sunday. Is that true? No. 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 First of all, it was almost certainly Saturday evening when they got together. We know it was an evening meeting, not a morning meeting. There were all those lanterns burning. He continued to speak until midnight, and then Eutychus fell, Eutychus fell out the window. He went down and healed him, and, and then kept on speaking until daybreak. Does that sound like a church service? A long church service if it was. Some church services have been too. <laughs> it was all about him leaving the next day. Yeah. So this is all about, you know, they wanted to hear everything he had to say before he left the next morning. It wasn't had anything to do with establishing a new day of worship. It's possible, let's be honest, it's possible that Luke might have been using the Roman system, at which um, the day started at midnight as they do now, and so it's possible this was Sunday evening, but if it was Sunday evening, then he was preaching until Monday morning. Uh, still doesn't make Sunday a day of worship. Um, well, could you clearly answer someone who claims that the late night meeting in Troas was the beginning of the trend regarding Sunday as a day of worship? You pretty much went over the list of, of things there. What passages or stories from the scripture would you recite to counter their arguments? Well, we've mentioned some of them. There's, there's other places where Paul repeatedly, on several occasions, Paul says he went into, he went to the church. In fact, one time, remember, uh, in um, Philippi, he went, there wasn't even a synagogue. So some people say, well, the reason he went to the synagogues on Sabbath is because that's when the Jews were there. But there wasn't even a synagogue in Philippi. He went out to the riverside, and he and his friends were wor worshiping there when they met uh, Lydia and all that, the rest of that story. And then uh, in, uh, was it Ephesus then where they, when he first got there and they kicked him out and he went next door, they continued on the Sabbath. They, you know, each yeah. Sabbath people would come. And uh, so it wasn't just, well, it's, now we can switch to Sunday because we're not in the synagogue. Yeah. What do we know about the beginnings of Sunday worship or even calling it the Sunday of the Lord's Day? Um, Dennis, I think you have something about, or is it Gordon? Dennis, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, although this term, Lord's Day, occurs frequently in the Church Fathers with the meaning of Sunday, the first conclusive evidence of such use does not appear until the latter part of the second century in the Apocryphal Gospel according to Peter. So now, how, how did Peter write a gospel in the second century? 
He didn't, but sometimes people <laughs> to have more punch yeah. would would sort claim, of claim, claim that they call the suit of pig falsely yeah. entitled. Yeah. Uh, where the day of Christ's resurrection is termed the Lord's Day. Since this document was written at least three quarters of a century, century after John wrote the Revelation, it cannot be presented as proof uh, that the phrase the Lord's Day in John's time refers to Sunday. You this remember. is probably in reference to the first chapter of yeah. Revelation where John was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. Exactly, exactly. So we know that there's no evidence of anybody using the term Lord's Day referred to Sunday or worshiping on Sunday until at least 75 years after, um, probably 75 years after all of the disciples were dead. Jesus said he was Lord of the Sabbath. Yes. But well, go ahead. Also, people, though, make decisions based on their emotions, and they use their intellect to justify it. So trying to wrestle someone out of Sunday belief isn't uh, even wise sometimes. You can present the truth, you can pray for them, uh, but really God has to do it. Yeah. Well, they have to have a desire on their own part. They got to start engage their brain. And if they're satisfied where they're at, man, uh, you can string a bunch of syllables together and you're not going to change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul had planned when he left after spending the winter in Corinth and writing those books to Galatians, the Galatians and the Romans, had planned to take a ship straight from there to somewhere down close to Palestine so he could get to Jerusalem in time for what? Passover. 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 But what happened? He discovered there were people trying to kill him. That he would be on the boat. was ready to get on the boat. He found out that there are a group of Jews already on the boat with the specific purpose of, of killing him. So were they going to, was it their purpose to kill him or to rob and kill? Since no, he probably. had all that money with yeah, him. Yeah, well, that's another possibility. So what he had to start walking back around, up through Macedonia and so forth, with, with all of his friends carrying all that money. Well... The fact that he was made aware of that plot is pretty incredible of itself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So obviously now he's not going to make it in time for Passover, so he, he sets his, his sights on, on Pentecost. Well, look at Acts 20, verses 15 to 27. We sailed from there and arrived off Chios the next day. A day later we came to Samos, and the following day we reached Miletus. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus so as not to lose any time in the province of Asia. He was in a hurry to arrive in Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, if at all possible. From Miletus, Paul sent a message to Ephesus asking the elders of the church to meet him. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I spent the whole time I was with you from the first day I arrived in the province of Asia. With all the humility and many tears, I did my work as a Lord's servant during the hard times that came to me because of the plots of some Jews. You know that I did not hold back anything that would be of help to you as I preached and taught in public and in your homes. To Jews and Gentiles alike, I gave solemn warning that they should turn from their uh, sins to God and believe in our Lord Jesus. And now in obedience to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit has warned me that prison and troubles wait for me. Wow. Okay. So... In what way did the Holy Spirit tell him to go to Jerusalem? Well, we had the same <coughs> question when he was on the second missionary journey where he was prevented from going north or going to Ephesus and he had ended up at Troas, so we had. So it's hard to say, although he did have, uh, in Second Corinthians, he talks about visions that he had. Uh, and uh, later on, when he is in prison, he has a vision of Jesus uh, encouraging him that mm -hmm. you will uh, testify me. Uh, not you know you testified here. You're also going to testify in Rome. Okay. Well, so clearly Paul had already let it be known that he had future plans. What were his future plans? To go to Rome. 
to go to Rome and, and Spain. Well, Spain. Paul Spain yeah. On to Spain. So he, he, remember Paul's idea was he would go to the major centers. He would plant a church there and he would say, okay, you guys spread the word out from here. And so he was planning to go on to Rome, do that in Rome, go on to some city in Spain and do it in Spain. So he, he thought he was done with Asia Minor, with Achaia, with Macedonia. That was his plan. Well, so what, what did he say to the Ephesian believers? I probably won't see you again, right? And they all wept. Well, one of the big issues at about the final days of Paul's third missionary journey was why he wanted to go back to Jerusalem. Did the Holy Spirit specifically instruct him to do so? Luke said so. Sounds like that from what Luke said. If so, why was he warned by so many not to go to Jerusalem? Apparently, they were also inspired by the Holy Spirit. Even prophets said that. Even prophets, Agabus. <coughs> well, you know? We know in part and we prophesy in part. And uh, let the prophets speak one at a time and let the others pass, pass judgment. So uh, some messages, uh, uh, they, they were aware of the dangers and uh, prophesied that these might happen, but it nece wasn't necessarily a certainty, perhaps. But of uh, course, but Paul had lots of Christian friends in Jerusalem, right? Not but really. So many, yeah. many more. Really. Well, he never really, you know, he had, when he came back from the Damascus experience, he had to sort of hide out and, and Barnabas, I think, sort of brought him in and, and then uh, I, I guess they listened to him when they had the Jerusalem Council, but, um, you know, they, they still re remembered. You know, if you've seen somebody having people imprisoned and even killed and you it, it's hard to get that out of your head yeah yeah if someone arrested your brother or sister or mother or father or whatever like that and had them killed you have some might. emotional yeah and he was relentless and he was uh, on fire mm -hmm. when he was doing all that and there were these exaggerated reports being brought back to Jerusalem, not by Christians, but by Jews, by strict Jews, that he was telling people not to be circumcised, etc. And they wanted nothing to do with him. They, they said, this guy's a traitor. He's an apostate. We need to get rid of him. Acts 23, 1 and 2. He was telling them not to be circumcised, wasn't he? Not the Jews. We're talking about we're talking about Christians. Okay, just, the, just, just the Gentiles. Okay. Gentiles. Yeah, the Gentiles. Yeah. <coughs> but he was saying it, it wasn't anything. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that may be coming up here. Yeah. Well, Judea had always been a hotbed of revolt against the Roman government. The Pharisees were always working quietly to oppose the Roman government. Now, let's just give a little background for those of you who are not so familiar with this background. There was a constant tension between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We don't recognize this, very few people recognize this, but there was a, there was a horse racing place almost right next to Caiaphas' house in Jerusalem. There was a big amphitheater there where they put on Roman pro programs and so forth, very near there and so forth like this. And the Greek way and then later the Roman way was that when you got into one of these cities, the idea was to turn it into a Greek city or a Roman city. And the idea is we want everybody to adopt Greek or Roman ways. And so the Sadducees in general thought, well, let's just get along with the Romans. There's no, it's, it's, it, there's no way we're going to beat them with under the, un, something miracle happens. So let's just, let's just cooperate with the Romans. Why not? And the Pharisees, no, they said, okay, look, we are, we are God's people. We need to stick to the Bible. We need to follow God's plan for our lives. We're never going to be anybody unless we strictly follow the Bible. So there was constantly that tension going on between the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's just one of many tensions between the two of them. So the, the Pharisees always are sort of whatever we can do to sort of knock the Romans. 
Well, if you had been an advisor to Paul, would you have told him to stay away from Jerusalem? Probably. Yeah, sounds like a plan. <laughs> sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, why do you think Paul wanted to go? Did Paul really want to go to Jerusalem? Or did he go just because he thought he had to? He wanted to mend fences. Yes. Okay. They were his brothers. Yeah. And, and uh, so he wanted to bring the Gentiles and the Jews together. I mean, he wanted... He was hoping that all that money would do something. Yes, that it would maybe change their hearts, see their... And he had a burden yeah. for the Jews, as he mentions sure. in several chapters in Romans. Especially Romans yeah. 10, 9, 10, yeah. 11, yeah. Right. And his experience with the Gentiles certainly had an influence as well because he probably had understood certain aspects of the gospel that those who had remained in the Jewish economy had not realized. And he felt the burden to share that with them. Yes. Um, this isn't the time for us to take time to discuss it, but Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 10 and, and I'm sorry, 8 and 10 uh, suggest that uh, Paul had felt at liberty to even uh, disagree with some of the edicts from the General Conference. Uh-oh. <laughs> Don't tell people that. Whoa. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not changed much, has it? It's... Now, Jackie, Still come on. Still going on. So was Paul in any way stubbornly determined to do what he wanted to do? He had a mission. He had a mission. He thought he, it out and he said, I can help, I, if, I, if it works, I can bring the Christians together, Jews and Gentiles, and I can maybe even convert some of my former associates from the Sanhedrin and other Jews. Mm -hmm. you know, let's do this. Yeah. Let's be peacemakers. He was misunderstood, maligned, mistreated, even reviled, but he pressed on in faith. Yeah. Jackie, I think you've got a paragraph for us there. All right. The success attending the preaching of the gospel aroused the anger of the Jews anew. Now, these are not Jewish Christians. These are the regular Jews. Yes. From every quarter were coming accounts of the spread of the new doctrine by which Jews were released from the observance of the rites of the ceremonial law, and Gentiles were admitted to equal privileges with the Jews as children of Abraham. Yeah. Paul's emphatic statement, and this is quotes, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision. Can we add female? No, yeah, no, I can't no later. we won't do that. That's, that's, in, <laughs> that's in Galatians. I don't, they should have quoted Galatians, I think, instead. Um, was re, he was regarded, uh, blah, 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 was regarded by his enemies as daring blasphemy, and they determined that his voice should be silenced. Ellen G. White, The Acts of the Apostles, 390. Yeah. As we will learn in future lessons, it was because of his Roman citizenship that the Romans' guards in Jerusalem were able to preserve Paul's life. Otherwise, he would have been killed in Jerusalem. Now, again, this is something that we need to understand about Jerusalem. If you, if you look up, you can look this up on the Internet if you want. Go to Google Images and, and look for uh, pictures of ancient Jerusalem. Uh, the Romans had built a high fortress right next to the temple. And why did they do that? The Jews in order. And how would the fortress right next to the Jews, right next to the temple, help? They could was, see, see what's going on. It was the center of, of the Jewish <laughs> economy. Well, and, and it was high enough, high and enough. so that they, at that top level, they could look down and they could watch everything, because they figured that if there was ever, ever a major rebellion started against the Roman government, it would start there, in the in the temple court. And so they had people constantly up there watching. Anything that looked like strange behavior, rioting, anything like that, boy, they were on top of it just like that. So that's what happened, I'm sure. This is their spying method. This was their spying method, yes. Well, as we will learn... The Pax Romana. The Pax Romana, there you go. <laughs> so they were able to preserve Paul's life. How did they do that? Or what happened there, uh, Jim? 
Never before had the apostle approached Jerusalem with so sad a heart. He knew that he would find few friends and many enemies. He was nearing the city which had rejected and slain the Son of God and over which now hung the threatenings of divine wrath. Acts of the Apostles 397. Now, the threatenings of divine wrath, does anybody, did anybody at that point know anything about that? Probably not. Probably not. And, so, but we good opportunity to define or give an explanation of what that is. Yep. God permitted the Romans to do what they wanted because the, the Jewish leaders and the Jewish uh, population was uh, being rebellious to the organization. They subject, subjected themselves to laws that were not good, yeah. similar to Ezekiel 20, 25, and 26. Yeah. It wasn't God d doing, any, doing it to them. Well, do you think it was God's plan to have Paul put his life in danger as he did? Now, I mean, this thing about this, we know that there are multiple ways in which God could have preserved Paul's life. He had preserved the life of Jesus multiple times. He just, nobody could see him. He just slipped through the crowds. He was gone. He could have done that with Paul. <coughs> he could have told Paul, okay, now's the time to leave Jerusalem prematurely before all this started. There's all kinds of ways that he could have preserved. He could have preserved, well, we're going to talk about more about what happened at the rest, uh, at the arrest of Paul later, but um, many of the Jews, and now I'm going to read another section. This is from um, Acts of the Apostles, page 405. Many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel still cherished a regard for the ceremonial law and were only too willing to make unwise concessions, hoping thus to gain the confidence of their countrymen to remove their prejudice and to win them to faith in Christ as the world's Redeemer. I hope that the moves that were made by these people later were really because they were trying to win people for the gospel. That sometimes it doesn't sound too much like that. Paul realized that so long as many of the leading members of the church at Jerusalem should continue to cherish prejudice against him, they would work constantly to counteract his influence. Now here you are, you are the, the best worker that the church has, and headquarters is doing everything they can to cut you apart. How does that work out? It's not unusual. Ooh. <laughs> he felt that if by any reasonable concession he could win them to the truth, he would remove a great obstacle to the success of the gospel in other places. But he was not authorized of God to concede as much as they asked. Now, we'll, read, we'll, we'll study more about what actually happened uh, when we get to our next lesson, but... That's actually the Apostles, page 401. God did not authorize him to concede as much. What does that mean? What do they want him to do? Um, pay for a, a vow that uh, certain men were taking and to, to go with them. And he would have to purify himself first because he had been with Gentiles. Yes. Comply with Jewish rituals. Yeah. And we're going to, again, we're going to talk about this more next week, but why would a Christian even want to do one of those Jewish rituals? Well, yeah, we'll let you, you think back, about that. If you go back, re read back in the Old Testament, all the things yeah. you had to do with, the, it wasn't just bring the lamb, there was yeah. several pieces of, of, oh, yeah. of things that you had to Well, bring. Paul was willing to move forward even the most difficult circumstances willing to sacrifice his life if necessary. Would, would we be willing to do that? Are we as sure as Paul was about the mission which we are called to do? If we spend most of our waking hours at work, are we being successful at carrying the gospel to our co-workers? Now, some of us might have the privilege of working with Adventists. I hope that's a privilege. Um, but some, there's others who work, well, I work with a lot of people who are not Adventists. Do we have a responsibility to try to carry the gospel to them? Sure, yeah, sure. Should the occasion arise, definitely. Every once in a while, I like to think about what would it be like to be on Satan's side. Uh, try to imagine yourself for a moment in the stories we just talked about, Paul. Have you been in the 
counsels of Satan, what would you have said? Well, well, how would you respond? Let's stir up the mob at Ephesus. One. Let's take him out on the ship, but mm. get his money too. Yeah, we've got to get rid of this guy any way we possibly can. I'm sure Satan felt just repeatedly frustrated. He must have been incredibly frustrated. In Ephesus, Paul had to meet with paganism, magic, money, and political influence. If, and unfortunately, I have to tell you, if, we were, if you were to take a world religions class in one of many universities in the developed world today, you would find that they talk about the miracles that Peter and Paul performed as if they were some kind of magic similar to what shamans and magicians might do today. While there are some similarities, there's clear differences, and the real difference is the intent and the results. However, we must recognize the day is coming when miracles will occur everywhere. Both the devil and God will send angels who will work, who will appear as human beings in, on this earth. Uh, Carrie? Yes. Satanic agencies in human form will take part in this last great conflict to oppose the building up of the kingdom of God. And heavenly angels in human guise will be on the field of action. That's from SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4. Page 1142, paragraph 7. Christ and his angels come to us in the form of human beings, and as we converse with them, light and grace and joy fill our hearts. Our spiritual energies are quickened, and we are strengthened to do the will of God. Though we know it not, we are conversing with an angel, an angel in human guise. Wow. So we know then, I mean, if those statements are correct, and I absolutely believe they are correct, the time is coming, maybe not too far in the distance, when the devil will be sending human beings, angels in the form of human beings, God will be sending angels in the form of human beings to work both sides of the great controversy. Well, we know that it's only because of God's limitations on the devil that we have survived at all. But miracles will happen in our day, but not usually in the developed world where there are so much critical, so many critical skeptics. I personally know about the stories of three different times in three different countries where people have been raised from the dead in our day. So why not here? Are we prepared uh, for what is coming in our world? Can we imagine ourselves traveling with Paul on any of his missionary journeys? Well, I'll leave that question with you. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these stories from the experiences of Paul and his friends. We, we realize that he had an incredible amount of courage, that he did not fear virtually anything, that he, he felt like he was walking in the path that you wanted him to walk. He made mistakes, as we all do, but he definitely created an enormous uh, impetus to the gospel to large areas of the then known world. May we someday, beginning now we should say, have the opportunity to do some spreading of the gospel just as he did is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.